ready? At seven already? Yep, it is. Okay, good evening. We're really happy to have Karen Miriam Goldberg on campus today. She's been very busy. She's visited a poetry writing class, a women's studies class, and the Ag Arts group. <clears throat> She's came from her reception with them. Um, Karen Miriam Goldberg wears a lot of hats. If you talk to her for about five minutes, you'll find out how busy, very busy she is. She's right now on a book tour for her memoir, The Sky Begins at Your Feet. <clears throat> and I read this book this, this summer. It's a very, very, very moving account of her survival of uh, genetic-based uh, breast cancer. But it's more than that. It's a book about community. It's a book about human beings helping each other and the bonding that occurs within a family. Um, Karen is also one of the founders of the Bioregionalism Congress, and she just told the Ag Arts group about that, which is, um, um, she couldn't describe it, so I don't know how I'm supposed to describe it, but it's a, it's a group that's, uh, again, place-based and embraces the, uh, everything from the folk life to the agriculture of your own environment. Um, she is also the author of 10 books, and many of them include poetry. Oops. She has a new book, book of poetry called Landed that we're going to hear a little bit from tonight. And then I hope she'll also talk to you a little bit about her work at Goddard College, where she does um, teaching of writing and writing workshops with um, communities, based in communities. All right, please help me welcome Karen Miriam Goldberg. Thank you so much, Mary. Thank you for coming. And um, before I talk too much, I'd like to kind of start with a poem as a kind of invocation. And this is from Landed. It's called Questions for Home. And can you hear me okay? Did you imagine there was more than this? More than the grass or the sky? More than a quick touch of a six-year-old's fingertips on your sleeve? Did you believe it would add up to a history of torrent and mathematics, ultimate meanings, causes and effects intersecting like constellations of the greatest minds you never knew? It's just a gravel road in the country an edge of grassland washed out of its redness. It's just a bobcat you missed because you opened the door a second too soon. The breeze inside the breeze, the dominant gate of weather, the green light in the distance. Here, don't be afraid. It's not like you lost anything but the craving for craving, and even that will return. Where else would you rather be than right here where the bluebird blurs past the cedars and time sheds its old skin so a new one can form? I'm very happy to be here to be reading primarily from my memoir, The Sky Begins at Your Feet, but also some poetry and also telling you a little about my involvement in bioregionalism, which is a movement that probably has been kind of going in one form or another for about 40 years that basically translates into learning from your place how to live, what to create, what to do with your life. And I'd like to read you kind of a short definition of this and then talk just briefly about um, the three R's of bioregionalism to me, which are re-inhabitation, reciprocity, and restoration, and then um, spend most of the time doing some reading. Um, Stephanie Mills, who some of you may have read, wonderful place-based author, in conjunction with a group of us, wrote this statement, which I think kind of describes bioregionalism, and you'll hear that it informs my work quite deeply. Across the planet, people recognize that we must become guardians of our life places, 
human beings have long understood that security is found in acting responsibly at home, in our neighborhoods and watersheds, our bioregions. Bioregions are living systems where every being is connected to and interdependent with every other. Bioregions are not by property line states or nations, but rock, soil, weather, terrain, plants, animals, human cultures, and human settlements. Bioregionalism calls for active citizenship in the whole of life, yet its key understanding is cultural. Attention to place, to local history, natural history, and to how a community's hopes, wounds, and dreams can inform enduring ways of life that heal our planet's bioregions and their inhabitants. Bioregionalism cultivates the natural history of all our relations in order to craft diverse human societies respectful of peace and planet. Bioregionalism means working to satisfy basic needs locally, relying on renewable energy, sustainable agriculture, developing local enterprises based on local skills and strengths. Bioregionalism challenges and is an alternative to nationalism, corporate rule, and top-down globalization of our lives. Bioregionalism embraces the struggle around the world to preserve, restore, and enhance the life of the distinct places that constitute the planet. Um, talking about bioregionalism would you know, if I really just kept going, would probably eat up all the time. So I'd like to kind of use these three quotes that have to do with, um, to me, how we can interact with place as a way of learning who we are, as a way of also creating um, in the arts. And particularly since I'm moving toward reading from memoir and poetry, um, I'm speaking in some ways about restoration of our lives. Um, I'd like to start with a quote by David Abram, who wrote a marvelous book called in The Spell of the Sensuous, which I highly recommend. And he talks about reciprocity, the reciprocity between who we are and the other species in our home areas. And he writes... Our bodies have formed themselves in delicate reciprocity with the manifold textures, sounds, and shapes of the animate earth. Our eyes have evolved in subtle interaction with other eyes as our ears are attuned by their very structure to the howling of wolves and the honking of geese. To shut ourselves off from these other voices to continue by our lifestyle to condemn those other sensibilities to the oblivion of extinction is to rob our own senses of their integrity and to rob our minds of their coherence. We are human only in contact and conviviality with what is not human. And I find that this is extremely true for me as a writer, um, as a person living on the land, um, the tall grass prairie in the Kansas area watershed, um, about four and a half hours from here, and yet at the same time learning what this reciprocity means is a lifelong education. And so I share with you this poem that I wrote called Beginner. Where is that heart? the center of the field swung open by the wind so that we can see what's still wet and ready to unfurl. Where's the ledge? Where's the grief that tears apart all the fencing? Where's the sudden quiet when the light through the cedars dissolves shadows and the grasses ignite against the changing dirt? Where's the exact location where no answers matter? What does it mean to inhale the surrender, to exhale into a sky that holds up twisting charms of goldfinch and battered clouds, ready to change into something else? How do I bend to get there? 
In terms of reciprocity, um, I believe all of us who are doing place-based work, place-based art, we are learning to develop that relationship between us and the more than human world. And so often that relationship comes through our senses, through what we see, hear, touch, taste, smell, through what we experience in our bodies that tells us where we are. The next R I'd like to land on is restoration, and sometimes in the bioregional movement and other movements, this is even toyed with to, to refer to restoration, to find the stories that tell us about place and help us understand the places where we are, to unearth the stories of human settlement, the stories of long before human settlement, what is the history, what is the future, what are the seasonal cycles. These are all ways that we can come to know where we are. And um, to kind of illustrate through my own writing, I'd like to share a poem called The Dreaming Land, which um, you could say it's my projection on the natural world. You could say it's me leaning into what I imagine some of the stories to be. The Dreaming Land. I dream of spring when the sky dampens the seeds of gathering heat. The diving crow aims toward what was just born, and even the driveway gravel glitters in the stark white light between storm and night. I dream of the winter's black and white landscape scribbled green, punctured by the maroon tip of root in a field clean black with fire, while the cottonwoods unfurl their pale green hearts. The land dreams sky, a shifting infusion of shadow on cloud, despite the unreliability of rain or clarity. The deer dreams fawns. The fawns dream flight as they walk the through line of the horizon. The horizon never stops dreaming. It's sleep a progression of filtering color through space. The dream always dreams possibility juxtaposed against decay, lightning, a first redwood redbud blossom, or a starling feather stuck on a rooftop. The rooftop dreams belly up to the sky, its dream a song of shelter and risk. The sky dreams light rolling away from dark, dark rolling away from light, expansive as sorrow that permeates the poorest souls of everything, from weather to the dog left alone in the living room, when I step outside in the dizzy of bird call, flocks pouring down onto the branches, swollen with the hard dreams of blossom. And finally, I'd like to land on re-inhabitation, which is truly at the core of bioregionalism. And by re-inhabitation, um, which will be even more obvious when I start reading from the memoir, I'm also thinking of how we can re-inhabit our own bodies, our homes, um, our communities. Peter Berg, who is one of the main founders of bioregionalism, writes, if the life-destructive path of technological society is to be diverted into life-sustaining distinctions, the land must be re-inhabited. Re-inhabitation means learning to live in place in an area that has been disrupted and injured through past exploitation. It means becoming aware of the particular ecological relationships that operate within and around it, it means understanding activities and evolving social behavior that will enrich the life of that place, restore its life-supporting systems, and establish an ecologically and socially sustainable pattern of existence within it. Simply stated, it involves becoming fully alive in and with a place. And that phrase is fully alive in and with a place. I believe that the more we can look at where we live as a door 
into who we truly are, um, look at our own bodies as the most local address we inhabit, the most local manifestation of the earth and sky, um, the more we can find our way to a sense of home that's enduring and life-giving. And I'd like to read you one more poem. The Door of the Grass. Where to go now that all roads dissolve? How to follow deer path or sudden partings of big blue stem, little blue stem, switch grass, into the field so deep you can no longer see the edges? No need to answer, says the wind, just walk. Just stop in the surprise of clearing where some other has stopped before you. Listen to the careful tremble, the heavier rushing tumbling upward and out from the tops of bordering cottonwoods. Let it sweep back over you, your mind only blossom and stubble, breaking against what you thought you knew until it too blows free or roots deeper into something like bedrock turning under us. Here in the house of the grass, wind tells the sea in you, the old stars in you too, welcome home. My memoir, The Sky Begins at Your Feet, um, very much is the story of surviving and thriving through cancer. But it's also other stories all layered together. The story of losing a parent, the story of finding the heart of the community where I live, um, the story of starting to understand so much how what we experience in our bodies in many ways comes from similar sources to the exploitation and degradation that the earth and sky around us experience. Um, and it's also very much a story about coming back to the body, coming to re-inhabit a body that um, has been through this and that and will continue to go through this and that, just like all our bodies. And so I'm going to kind of jump around the book, but I'll give you a little bit of preparation for where we're going. And at the end, we'll have some time for questions. And I'm going to start with the preface, um, because one of the big struggles, which is called singing the body electric, um, one of the big struggles for anybody who has body parts cut off is, what does it mean to be erotic? Um, in the sense that Audre Lorde means in being fully alive, but also in kind of the sexual sense that we sometimes think of for that word. I cannot figure out who I am as a body these days. I look in the mirror each morning, each night. I look right into the scars, trying to read them like the dreams I have of driving around lost for hours, not being able to make a phone call without punching in the wrong numbers. There is always an emergency. Right before the sleep that might take me back to such dreams, I touch my chest, feel the lines and the numbness too, try to measure with my fingers where the feeling begins and ends. Sometimes I use my husband's hand to show me where the nerve endings are and aren't anymore. Fortunately, his hands and the rest of him don't seem too distracted by the absence of these parts of me. On very hot nights, I lie under the swishing sailing fan naked, feeling a little like extraterrestrial woman, shaped differently but generally looking the same from most, as most women from a distance. The bed is large, a soft boat under the circular winds of the changing world. I get up in the morning and put my glasses on first, then strap on my fake breast, which have spent the night hanging out in the nifty pockets of my special bra. There's little difference between the glasses and the boobs to me, just things to wear when awake, an item to bridge the world between dreams and waking time, between whoever I am and the rest of the living world. Each is a prop, something that fills out space contributes to how I see or am seen, the prosthesis something between person and garment. Each day I walk among the other bodies, 
lately not so concerned with glancing at women's breasts, the ones not cut away and replaced by imposters. I find myself immediately thinking, in some kind of reptile brain way, that their breasts must be fake, rebuilt, or soon, but or real, but soon to be taken away. I pause and remind myself I'm simply projecting my thoughts from the dark and dry place I usually can't reach into my mind onto others. Sometimes I remember to remember that everyone has their own scars and numbness, most of these wounds not even physical. Yet at the same time, I find myself extremely confused about what it is to live in a woman's body without breast. Of course, I know breasts are just a body part, not a gender identity, but there's something about losing this part of me, this part I would hold gently on cold nights as I slept to keep them warm, this part round and lovely, traveling effortlessly with me, quiet morning doves sleeping soundly on my chest, it's inconceivable that this part could be gone, that I would have chosen to give it up, that there's so little evidence of their existence in my memory. That's part of my problem. In my memory, below the surface of words and rational understandings, breasts are a part of being erotic. The breasts are a great playground of sensation and lushness. Without them, what does it mean to make love? What does it mean to love my own body? So I am trying to love my body for what it is now. Let the love I feel for it, the tenderness for my moving fingers on the keyboard, the appreciation for the strength of my legs to carry me for miles on an early spring day, the wonder at the softness of my skin, the shapes I leave in the blankets. Let this love be enough. Let this love show me how to sing the body electric, to write the body erotic. Let me learn this way of loving what's imperfect from land and sky around me, the best mirror to show us that what we do to our environment, we also do to ourselves. As well, the earth where I live is the best teacher when it comes to persevering through the seasons with a kind of grace that celebrates life, however it comes. The icy wind midwinter that makes the windows tremble, the explosion of lilac one particularly slow spring, the reddening grass late fall, the black sheen of the crow midday when he shoots across the sky to examine the latest addition to our compost pile. Life just wants to live, the old saying goes, and this desire makes for tremendous innovation. There's so little script in this culture for such innovation when it comes to women's breasts, there's only the narrative everywhere I look of women made of curves and sleekness, women in clothing cut to highlight the roundness of breast. Meanwhile, I feel like a 12-year-old with my bare chest cut so close to the bone. Meanwhile, the rest of my body blossoms so much older than the child I was. Meanwhile, the breast in between past and present sleep on an invisible shelf. I step outside in the morning, the overgrown grass of early spring pouring over itself around the tilted cottonwood tree. The hills and grass around this home carry their own losses and scars, and yet are lit with a green both pale and fierce, quiet and shining, fully here at this moment and at the, on the verge of changing completely. I return to earth and sky, completely coming home. And now a little bit about the prairies, which we're all part of. Chapter one, getting lost. We were completely lost in the Flint Hills of Kansas and I didn't care. All we could see were wide expanses of hills, sky, cows, and the occasional rock, skeleton of a windmill, or fragmented stones from pioneer homes. I stared out the front passenger side window, marveling at the lush green rising and falling all directions. Hardly any power lines because there was so little to power. The land looked surely as it had appeared for hundreds, thousands of years. 
Tall grass sloped all over itself on what felt like the top of the world, and everywhere the wind conspired with the sun to make the grasses gleam. It felt like being at a very high altitude, only instead of mountains, windmills. Expansive as galaxies, the flint hills lay down all directions like long, lanky bodies rolling away or toward each other. The sky begins at your feet, writes essayist Anne Herbert, and there's nothing around like wandering the center of Kansas to prove this, and also to find how easy it is to get lost in the sky. Early this March morning, the sun illuminated the curves of the land and long shadows of trees and rock in such a way that we let ourselves get lost without a second thought. My friends and my nine-year-old daughter and I were driving all over Chase County looking for the ranch of a woman we were to visit. We planned this trip before on a whim to make local contacts for the Continental Bioregional Congress we were helping to organize at a nearby camp the following fall. Now we were driving eight miles in the vibrant hills down the wrong road. None of us spoke when we reached the dead end. Instead, Joy, just you turned the car around, skimming some of the grasses, and we headed back in the direction we came. We were too taken with the sensation that this land went on forever, which conflicts with what I know of the prairie bioregion, a span of grasslands that stretches from western Missouri into eastern Colorado, north into Canada, well past Winnipeg, south into Mexico. Out of all the types of habitat on this continent, none is threatened with extinction as much as the prairie. Only 1% remains, the other 99% lost to development, farming, or erosion. The prairie left may only be a fragment of the original, but it billows wide, framing a huge sky. Imagining when the prairie was 100% intact is akin to imagining infinity, or at least infinity divided into parcels of land. I didn't know that when we righted ourselves, found the woman we were to meet, delighted in driving all over the country for a few more hours, and made our way home, I would begin another type of trip. I didn't know that while I was merrily lost, a technician from our local hospital's mammography department was leaving a message on my answering machine that I needed to come back for further x-rays that further x-rays would lead to a biopsy with an old doctor, white tuft and shaking his head, who would say when he saw the mistletoe-shaped lump in my breast, yes, this looks very worrisome indeed. I just knew how alive I felt and how the world seemed at that moment of being lost to be forming anew, which was also true. Um, as I talked about at the Ag Arts Group, reception. Um, I was diagnosed with breast cancer halfway into organizing the Continental Bioregional Congress on the Prairies, which was held in 2002, and I was the lead organizer. And this next passage is about the meeting um, two or three days after my diagnosis with our organizing group to try to figure out what was next. Um, and also in the book, I kind of write about how I was in such a deep sense of denial that when friends sympathized with me, I felt like I actually was the friend sympathizing with me, um, which was a little scary but also interesting. So anyway, that afternoon we hosted a bioregional congress meeting in our living room, sitting with our friends more solemn than usual while the cold pressed up against the window. Someone put up an easel and a giant pad so we could go over the agenda. Written in red toward the middle of the paper was Karen's cancer, something we would have to deal with as a group. It felt squarely in the middle of an 18-month span where we were meeting monthly and I was working daily to bring together hundreds of people concerned with ecology and culture for the week-long Congress. Our planning group met monthly for three-hour sessions, so well organized from all the facilitation training we had been through that the time went quickly and tended to make us more awake and also more hungry. 
We ended with long, lingering potlucks, visiting around the table or the living room, or when it was warm outside on the table on the deck. Okay, said Ken, my husband. We thought we could start with, hu with fundraising, and then... Wait, said Rita. I don't feel like we can just go on like everything's normal. Rita was so committed to this event that she actually flew in to attend the monthly meetings from California, where she lived on a limited budget with her life partner, Rachel, and two very energetic dogs. A 50-ish woman with short hair, large breasts, and a hell of a singing voice, she found us a few years ago through an email and had quickly turned into someone who seemed like a friend for decades. I mean, Karen has cancer, and I just can't stand this. It's so unfair. All these friends of mine are getting cancer, and it's... I sat in the wooden rocking chair, stealing myself, frozen from the inside out as I listened. Rita was crying so hard she couldn't talk. As I circled the room with my eyes, I saw everyone else was crying too. Jerry, one of our closest and absolutely quietest friend, was holding our new kitten, his eyes red. Joy had tears running down her cheeks. I had met her two decades ago when we were learning energy conservation techniques in a local junkyard when she was a skinny girl with long braids and I was more New Yorker than Midwesterner. I heard Ken crying too, but I couldn't make eye contact without slamming into a wall of pain. It's like the earth, Rita managed to say. I nodded. It was exactly like the earth, which, as Stephanie Mills writes, perfectly bespeaks us. Ken and I had already talked late at night when I couldn't sleep, which was every night lately, about how the environmental po poisons couldn't help but affect our health. Research was now reflecting this more deeply and more as the pervasive, some, uh, pervasive causes of some cancers. Just last night, as I pulled on my nightgown, Ken told me, it's like uncontrolled growth. Cancer, you mean? Yeah, it's like the Highway 59 fight we're involved in to try to stop that highway. We're trying to stave off a kind of uncontrolled growth that de destroys an ecosystem. I thought of my own body now as an ecosystem. The land we were trying to protect in the highway fight was laden with historic markers, wagon, we, we, wagon train ruts from the Santa Fe Trail, and very probably of Native American burial site. There were virgin woods and native prairie. The land was like me, I thought, like my body bearing the marks of loss, as well as places young and healthy and places threatened with development. My breast harbored the agents of suburban sprawl. The back door opened and Curtis and a friend entered, having just driven here from Oklahoma and as usual late. Curtis half smiled, flipped his curly hair out of his face, and said with his strong Oklahoma accent and a tone that implied whatever, look, whatever looked so bad couldn't possibly be, this looks kind of heavy. It is, someone replied. When Rita told him I had cancer, he deflated and sank into the couch. His friend, a young woman named Sarah, happened to be wearing a button with a photo of a woman's chest after a mastectomy. I glanced at that button every so often, feeling reassured by the strength of the image and downright scared of the strength I'd need to grow in myself. Eventually, the meeting got underway. I agreed to take a few months off. Others picked up tasks. We went over fundraising efforts, talked about who would track down mailing lists, and if it were possible to start the website soon. As usual, we finished with a large potluck, sitting together at a table laden with Russian peasant soup, brownies, homemade bread, coleslaw, and chips. But nothing broke to, through to me until everyone was leaving and Jerry hugged me. He was the same height, his heart beating right into mine. We stood there a long time holding each other, each breath we took together, telling me I had cancer, but I had friends too. I let myself fall into that. Now for something a little different. Um, this is also the story of dealing with serious illness in a house full of kids. 
and my children were five, eight, and eleven when I was diagnosed. And uh, it kind of figures into this next piece, which is called The Tattooed Lady. I didn't hate my hair. Most women I did, I knew did, or at least fought with their hair occasionally when they weren't banishing it to ponytails or shortcuts. For me, my hair had been one of the few things right about my otherwise flawed appearance. When I hit puberty, my straight as a pin, thin brown hair turned curly and thick. I'm not sure how it happened, but at the same time, my brown eyes turned hazel. All I knew is that one day when I was 15 or so, I'd always been a late bloomer, I looked in the mirror and saw a girl with curly hair and green-brown eyes. I still lacked the freckles and high cheekbones I longed for, although my daughter ended up with those through the magic of genetics. I grew my hair long. I cut it short. I grew it out again. I permed it in the winter, then cut it back on a whim one summer day. Still, it came back fast, easy, so easy to maintain I didn't own a comb or brush. After my buzz cut, right after the second chemo treatment, when my hair was supposed to fall out, it fell out in such slow motion that I started to look less like a Holocaust victim and more like a very confused duckling. That's when I called Courtney and Denise, veterans of shaved head and lured by the promise of spaghetti and meatballs they came right over. While the pasta boiled, Denise shaved a checkerboard on my head, telling me it looked awesome. Courtney nodded, but Ken, walking in the door after a long day at work, told me I looked like a gang member. The kids trailing behind him just gaped at me. I went to the mirror, white supremacist. Not really my look, so I asked Denise to shave it all off. Back at the mirror with Denise's giggles behind me, telling me I looked beautiful bald, I found an image of someone hairless but friendly. I decided it was a good summer cut, so to speak, given that my only other choices were hats, do-rags, and wigs. Bald, that's what I'll do, I thought at that moment, looking in the mirror. At least that's how it started out. Sometime after spaghetti and meatballs, with Courtney and Denise joking about my new look and talking about how Denise planned to get pregnant within the next year if they could just find a willing donor, I found my hand reaching for a pack of fake tattoos, birds, all different kinds, cardinals, blue jays, eagles, owls. Some of the birds had wings outstretched, mid-flight, others were perched or nested. The tattoos were Natalie's, and neither she nor I knew where they came from. Tattoos, bald head. A flash of electricity jumped between them. I knew what I had to do. I put a cardinal over my left eye, a goose over my right, and the others became part of a garland around my head. Flight, wings, color, beauty, they just seemed to belong there. When I came back to the table where Forrest, age five, was passing out ice cream bars, he started giggling. Are those permanent? Daniel asked. Oh my God, said Natalie, but she was smiling. Mom, you got freaking birds on your head. Ken opened his mouth but didn't say anything. Denise applauded and rushed to hug me. Courtney rolled her eyes. The tattoos were indeed temporary, and within a week the birds started to tatter. But I found a toy store that carried a lot of temporary tattoos. As word got out, tattoos started coming in the mail, even some Frida Kahlo paintings. I could never figure out how to apply the large image, they were like this big, of her paintings, of her face to my head. It became a ritual. Once a week, I would shave my head smooth of the nubs that started to erupt, then carefully with a wet washcloth, apply a circle of mammals, amphibians, butterflies, or flowers. The ring of flora and fauna lightened up the chemo for the kids and me and took the bald edge off my life. Once, as I lifted a bag of groceries, a woman called out, Hey, I like your fishies. I turned and looked at her, trying to smile as I corrected her. They're whales. I walked into the hall of Forest Elementary School where some kindergartners stared at my head, so I bent down. Wow, dogs, one said. This one looks like our puppy. For a chemo appointment, I wore flowers, small delicate pansies, daisies, and roses. For taco dinner at Ken's parents' house, I sported small woodland creatures, a fox over the third eye. 
For getting the oil changed in the car, I wore wolves. I wore prairie dogs to a Highway 59 meeting, farm animals to a Bioregional Congress potluck. One day, when a teacher saw my bald head as I picked Natalie up, he looked at my garland of galloping horses and called out, Hey, who did you lose a bet with? God, I answered. But it turned out that at least God had a sense of humor, and there was something about wearing a ringlet of kittens around my scalp that made chemo seem a lot less like a pack with the devil. Um, I'm going to kind of go back to the Bayer Regional Organizing and read you about the Congress that happened. And this Congress was actually held within a day or two after my last chemo infusion. And it's called Kissing the Sky. It was near sunset and the air was cool and bright as Angelica took my hand and I in turn took the hand of the woman next to me. At the Bayer Regional Congress, I stood on a ridge on the prairie within a circle of 40 or more women from Mexico, Canada, and the U.S. Wind everywhere, the sky a kind of crystal blue, almost dark and filled with light, the sky, kind of sky that shone most often in early autumn. And Helica, a medicine woman from the Cuernavaca area of Mexico, a grandmother with the face of a female Dalai Lama, encouraged everyone to sing loudly in Spanish, even if we didn't know the words. Laura, who felt like more sister than friend to me, who had come to previous congresses where we plotted and organized and laughed together about how beautiful this work was, held my hand. With her long black curls, dark eyes like stones at the bottom of a fast river, her curves and swaying skirt, she threw her arms around me. She was here from Cuernavaca, and afterwards her family would stay at our house for a week, joining the 20 or so other Mexicans who would also remain in Lawrence so that we could gather nightly for barbecued tofu and tequila. On the other side of Laura was Rita, her short gray hair, her eyes shining, her heavy breast hanging low in her tank top. Joy was there too, tall and looking at me, nodding. I remembered how over a decade ago, in the Congress at the, in the Ish Valley of British Columbia, Joy and I wept in each other's arms at the end of a long ritual led by Starhawk, a Jewish pagan activist who talked in heavy Brooklynese and led groups in dance and dances and marches like nobody's business. We sang, and then someone at the end of a circle kissed the person next to her who passed the kiss on until it reached me, and I gave Angelica a kiss on her beautiful cheek. She touched her cheek, then her lips, and lifted her hand as she arched her back, we all looked up as she threw the kiss into the big blue sky. As I watched the gesture, I had the feeling that at this moment, with an old Mexican healer woman throwing a kiss into the sky, something important was happening for me in ways I couldn't yet understand. Then she yelled full-throated prayers in Spanish. We all called into the sky, the blueness of it taking our words someplace we couldn't yet see. Earlier in the Congress, 130 of us from Toronto, Mexico City, the Ozarks, New York, San Francisco, and many points in between stood in the big field between our meeting hall and the cabins. Atop a wide mound in the Flint Hills, I once again experienced the sensation of being at a high altitude, despite my body feeling shaky and tired after the last round of chemo. I looked around the circle to see people I had met two decades before when my biggest yearning was for Ken to tell me more about how he saw our relationship, he did, and my biggest fear was whether I would ever lose my extra 10 pounds. I didn't. 
Those decades of Congresses were a heady time, meeting in a British Columbia longhouse to listen to elders from First People Nations tell us how their people suffered, or in western Missouri to row to a middle of a lake in small boats and stay there so we could listen to the Paul Winter Consort floating around each other in three rowboats as they played flute, guitar, didgeridoo, and drums. Now we were fatter, grayer, our eyes more wizened, and our hearts more broken. But we were still listening intently to each other, trying to learn from one another how to live in community, how to live with greater respect for land and sky. As usual, at the start of our gatherings, we went around the circle, asking people to say their names, homes, and passions. I saw Daniel, who was 12 at the time, standing between two tall men, trees around him. And when it was his turn, he said loudly, My passion is to bring together science and the arts and to help bring down the Bush administration. Applause and laughter. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw Natalie playing Red Rover with a group of kids, all of them rushing across a small stretch of grass. Forrest was sitting next to them reading the latest Harry Potter book. As I returned my attention to the circle, there was Ken, just a dozen people away from me, smiling. He looked more relaxed than I'd remembered seeing him for the last six months. Someone said something to him and he laughed quietly, caught me watching him and raised his eyebrows quickly. My vision was like this now, a little wider than before the cancer. I reminded myself often to direct my gaze at the edge of what I could see, take in the tree trembling in the wind when I couldn't feel, a child reading on a rock, a man happy with his own skin, the whole circle at once, my sight flooded with love. On the way back to Lawrence after the Congress, I drove with two of the kids and Angelica in the van on a day clear and cooling, the signs of autumn everywhere in the reddening grass and yellowing leaves. Ken was coming later after cleaning up. Angelica spoke almost no English and I spoke no Spanish. I drove occasionally looking at her and smiling. She was always smiling back. A flock of birds, large and wide, swept up from the horizon. Around us, the grasses, all turning red for the fall, covered all we could see. Red, I said, pointing to the grasses. Roja, she answered. We both nodded. Later, back at our house, with a dozen Mexicans filling our couches and chairs, occasionally breaking into song and laughter, Joy and Jerry noticed something I did. If we complimented them on anything, a shirt or bracelet, they immediately took it off and gave it to us. Daniel had earlier told Angelica she had a beautiful woven wallet. She quickly removed her U.S. and Mexican money and handed it to him. Taking their cue, we started handing each other earrings and scarves. This is the way we're supposed to live, Joy said, kissing me goodbye as she wore her new and my old hummingbird earrings. And Helica, ready to return to Mexico, had assembled her suitcase and bags around her and headed toward me with Laura, who with her husband Fabio and children had bonded like superglue to our family, all of us cleaning the house together, preparing food. You must stay beautiful, Laura, one of the most gorgeous women any of us knew, said fiercely. It is up to the women to carry the beauty forward. It's up to us, I asked feeling suddenly very dowdy and lumpy in my worn jeans and old sweater. Yes, we are the women. We are the ones who are the holders of beauty in the home, the Congress, the land, the world. She answered, smiling widely and lifting her eyebrows. Angelica said something in Spanish to Laura, and she nodded quickly and kissed Angelica's cheek before turning back to me. My beauty, Laura said, you are all cured now. And Helica said so. The three of us smiled at each other. And I'm going to kind of jump a little ahead. Um, my cancer took about, I don't know, 14, 16 months, I lose track, and included three major surgeries and six months of chemos. And this was kind of written... Um, as I was heading into a double mastectomy. 
and it's called Show Us Your Hooters. That's what the bumper sticker said on the truck right in front of me at the stoplight. It was two days before my breast were to be cut off, and here I was confronted with a giant bumper sticker to remind me I lived in a world where breasts were the central focus of men. Breast in bras, breast in bikinis, breast under sweaters, breast filling out t-shirts, breast under jackets and inside pullovers, breast peeking out the top of a shirt or hiding safely inside. Breasts are huge for me, a man said to Ken. Isn't this hard for you? Ken looked at the guy as if he was from another planet. It's nothing, he told the man, compared to Karen keeping her life. The ground kept shifting. I told myself, using every phrase I could think of, what was going to happen. Double mastectomy, breast lopped off. Bilateral mastectomy, breast cut off, deboobing. Mammatus interruptus, titty termination, hooter annihilation, boobectomy, even one Daniel made up, deracking. The landscape of my body was to change drastically, yet I realized I was also giving up my breast willingly, a willing sacrifice, a letting go in the name of life, a release from the body for the body. And this next section, before the last section I'll read, is called Burying the Breast. It was an unusual spring night because it was windless, something very uncommon for Kansas in April. But it was dark and sweet, the scent of just opening lilies of the valley and lilac lacing the air on the eve of my mastectomy. Once we got the kids in bed, the house quiet enough to slip away with no one noticed, we stepped outside our bedroom door onto a deck, Ken with a shovel, me with several pieces of paper and a candle. The candle was shaped like a flower, petals of pink wax tinged with rosy edges, and I lit it quickly. It was strange to watch the flame remain lit, not even faltering as Ken and I walked into the dark yard up the hill behind our house. I didn't think I'd ever successfully light a candle outdoors in Kansas because of the constant wind. We climbed the hills carrying our wares. Already my throat was a little dry, and I knew I wouldn't be allowed even water between now and sometime after the surgery. We walked up a path we had simply made by walking it over dead tree branches, leaf-colored ground, between cedar trees and under Osage orange trees until we were most of the way up the hill. We arrived at a small clearing, my thighs sore. Here, I told Ken, I placed the candle at the base of a tall tree to cedar tree and unfolded the pages. I read about the gratitude I had for my bones, blood, organs, and the space in between, which together gave my life, gave, gave me life breath by breath that carried me through growth and healing that made life possible and holy in this holy body. I thanked my breast for protecting my heart, bringing me pleasure, feeding my children, filling out my clothes, balancing my hips, adding roundness, softening my edges. I read my intentions for surgery, my wish for enough strength, courage, faith, and love to grow in spirit through all aspects, my desire to heal from all the effects, my trust that all the people involved would do well, and my hope to open my heart through this. I asked for guidance and healing, alertness and quick recovery, to go wherever I needed during surgery and to come back completely. I looked up at Ken and could see tears on his face in the dappled light, the clouds above, the candle below, as he stepped on the shovel and pushed it into the ground. Once the earth was open, I placed all the pages I had read, carefully folded, in the space between the dirt, and we buried those words. I blew out the candle and left it at the base of the tree as a gift. Um, the epilogue of this book is called Happy Anniversary, Darling, and I'm going to read you the very short fifth and sixth anniversaries. 
fifth anniversary. And would you like some water? No. You sure? Okay. Okay. That's okay. The fifth anniversary is supposed to be the biggie, like the 50th of a marriage, something to celebrate with balloons and ballrooms, only for cancer it's a quieter affair. We go to a place full of drama and herds of people from around the world, the Grand Canyon. That afternoon I walked down the path with Ken and Forrest, the other kids back at the motel room fighting over the remote control. After colder temperatures than expected for late March, the sun is back out, and it's nearing 50 degrees. Forrest and I walk hand in hand around the paths moved by millions of people over the years, encircling the interior of a large curve of rock. We come to an arch of stone and take each other's pictures there, standing in the protected place of light and stone, dirt and depth. When I look down, even walking for an hour, I still can't see the bottom. Only clusters of green treetops, more slants and half circles of reddening stone. I wonder what it's like down there, but for now there's only the walk back up and the need to lean against the canyon wall as the long line of tourist-laden donkeys passes by. The next day, we leave early to visit friends in Santa Fe, encouraging the kids to wrap themselves in fleece in their seats and return to sleep. It's barely light, and driving east from the canyon, we soon have to turn on our windshield wipers to clear the snow. Falling sparsely at first, then fierce and full, the flakes large as quarters. Over the next three hours, we drive through multiple nuances of winter and spring, the light hidden, the light returning. Crossing the Navajo Reservation, which holds the Hopi Reservation, which holds more of the Navajo Reservation, we change time zones seven times. Time and weather, Ken's hand steady on the wheel, his eyes taken the rise and fall of land, the way a small cottonwood on a hill leans north from the south wind, the detail of a kind of sage he remembers from years before, and at the same time, the road. About a year after my treatment ended, I began co-writing songs with rhythm and blues singer Kelly Hunt. Our first song, which we were brought together to write for a breast cancer awareness show, featuring her songs, my poetry, and a dance troupe, is one of my favorites, especially the bridge. I love this body that's not the way I thought. I love these people who help me through the dark. I love this life that keeps me waking up. I hear Kelly singing those words in my mind now as I watch the sky, how it deepens just a little around the edges of mountains, trees, clouds. Her voice is deep and wide, a little like a river rushing through a narrow pass of ancient rock. I lean back and listen. Our fiercest losses can bring us closer to each other in the earth. Every place we go, just another way to step into the air, to land on the ground. The sixth anniversary passes unnamed, but I remember it while I wait for chicken enchiladas somewhere in the middle of Ohio with Ken Forrest and Natalie. Daniel is at college, a small Mennonite school in Newton, where he can study environmental science, find everyone in the 500-member student body as a friend, and hold down two jobs, vacuuming the cafeteria and weeding a small native prairie. We're on our way back from New Jersey, where we just helped my mother move Henry, my stepfather, into a Jewish nursing home where they do wheelchair tai chi to Yiddish folk songs. His chemo treatments for pancreatic cancer have shrunk his tumor, but also sparked a kind of trauma-induced dementia, a rare effect, we're told. The trip is sudden. My mother called to give us an update on Henry, and since spring break was upon us, I hung up, called Ken to see if he could take off work for a week, and we started driving. Now five days later, we're driving west. Again, it's the spring equinox, March 21st, the same day I was told I had cancer. The anniversary passes me as I pass it. How long has it been? A friend with lung cancer will ask me a month from now, and I tell her my last anniversary. 
In the uncontrolled cellular sprawl of this disease, so much get measured, gets measured by fruit, as in his tumor was the size of a grapefruit or anniversaries, as if a seasonal marker is a kind of victory. You're still here, I tell Linda in the cancer writing group after she recounts her death sentence two to five years, according to an oncologist six years ago. Yes, I am, she answers, then opens her book to begin writing. A year from now, a month from now, a day from now, a game I play with myself trying to grasp what's ungraspable. Time moves like water, changes life, even in stillness, motion. An hour from now, I will be carrying a suitcase, computer, bag of oranges, pillow, and large bag of toiletries across a parking lot. It will be dark, the sky moist with the rain about to break, the wind slightly balmy, slightly chilled as it pours across me. I will struggle to balance everything, and at the same moment I'll tell myself, see the beautiful world as it's actually happening. But for now, I'm placing a small piece of these delicate chicken enchiladas on Ken's plate, asking Natalie how she likes her salad helping Forrest remove the extra cheese from his tacos. I lift my water glass, take a sip. Water, time, change. I tell my body, this body, which is my most local address on earth, happy anniversary, darling. Thank you. Yes. I wrote all the way through, and I actually would hand my oncologist pages I wrote for each treatment. And to his credit, he put it in my medical file. And that helped a great deal because, you know, you write about weird reactions to drugs and strange dreams. And it's good to have somebody read that. Um, so that was kind of the basis of the book, and that was um, a journal I called Chemo Pause, and then it expanded to the memoir. Yes, other questions? Yes. Um, you talked about the bioregionalism of the conference. Mm -hmm. uh, body. I'm wondering what kinds of things you're plotting, what kinds of actions your group is. Mm -hmm. Um, of the Bioregional Congress? Well, um, mostly what our group does is local, I mean, our local group is local education, workshops, gatherings, um, how to, hands on things to do, such as home weatherization, solar panels, um, local agriculture, and Mostly what we were plotting was kind of the organizing of the big Congress. The group that I also wrote about all through here was the Highway 59 group, where we were definitely plotting. And we were fighting the highway department to try to stop a highway that, as you heard, would have destroyed a lot of land. And in the end, we got a half victory. Instead of them expanding the existing highway, they're now building a freeway um, close to the old highway instead of a new freeway a mile over, which would have created a development loop. So I think that's where most of like the hands-on, more political plotting was going on. Okay. Yes, um, if you would like to learn more about any of this, um, please go to biocongress.org. And if you forget any of that, um, I have brochures for the Kansas Poet Laureate there in the back. Take one. It has my website. You can drop me an email, and I'll give you all the information. And there's also a wonderful bioregional listserv that has great discussions. And it's also well moderated, so things don't get too insane as they can get on listservs. So, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Mm 
Mm-hmm. Well, ours are both two years long, and it's pretty cool that we have two poet laureates right here. Um, you know, who knew? You know, um, my main projects involve kind of traveling around Kansas leading writing workshops, but also training people in communities to facilitate ongoing circles, writing circles. Um, And that comes from just my understanding of what we need most if we're writers, artists, is community. You know, people you can share what you're working on with, get feedback, encourage each other, maybe even create together, do collaborative work, help, you know, work together to get your work out in the world. And so I do that, but um, another project I do is a tiny little radio show, like four and a half minutes on High Plains Public Radio, which is called Write From Your Life. And I also offer writing prompts and um, incentives and background for people um, on a fairly extensive blog that I keep. And the brochures back there of my website can help link you to that. But it's kind of similar to what Mary does, traveling around negotiating with different groups, institutions, doing whatever we can do to help support people involved in the literary arts and support many voices being heard. Can you tell a little bit about your work at Goddard? With the mm-hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, this is always confusing to people, you know, because I live in Kansas. I teach in Vermont. Right now I'm in Iowa, so I don't know how I explain it all. But... Um, <laughs> I teach in a low residency program, so I spend a week there with other faculty and other and students. It's an individualized MA program. Everybody designs their own study. And then afterwards, after our residencies, everybody kind of flies or drives or walks home if they're very close. And um, I work with a small number of students very intensively on work that has to do with social change and personal growth at once. And it's incredibly interdisciplinary. And within that program, I founded and direct something called Transformative Language Arts, which I think is um, definitely something Mary is pioneering in the world in many ways, and many of you probably are. And that's how can we use our words out loud and on the page to change the world for community building, spiritual exploration, individual transformation, um, advocacy, political change, and so on. So I have been facilitating groups for many populations, um, particularly for people who are often silenced or marginalized, um, low-income people at a housing authority, the elderly at risk or underserved teens, um, the Latino community in Kansas City, some rural communities where um, there's not much support for the arts. I've been facilitating groups for many years in that vein, and I now realize that the, although the impulse to use words to make the world a little better is very old, probably goes back to all language unto itself, um, the name transformative language arts is fairly new. And it's been growing, and it's happening in some ways all over the world. We have the program at Goddard. There's an annual conference. The seventh annual one is next fall in Vermont. There's a not-for-profit organization called the Transformative Language Arts Network. And I also have little brochures about TLA back there, and I'm happy to talk to anybody about it. I once described TLA to somebody in the bioregional movement. He said, Well, it's the same thing as bioregionalism turned sideways, which it kind of is. It's kind of giving voice and vision to where you are and trying to learn from that. Yes? Mm -hmm. Um, I identify quite a bit with being a survivor, but in part that's largely because of my family history. My mother and aunt have each had breast cancer twice. My mother had colon cancer. My father and my stepfather both died of pancreatic cancer. My uncle died of pancreatic cancer. And some of us have the BRCA mutation, the breast cancer genetic mutation. Um, And kind of from that perspective of having found myself in cancer world about 10 years ago, You know, I do feel kind of a kinship to that world. I also do ongoing workshops for people living with cancer. 
and their caregivers. And I just find, you know, I just love doing that because, um, as I mentioned earlier, the veneer is off and everybody's ready to write about what's most important to them. So, you know, I, I assume I'll feel like a survivor most of my life. But I still think of my anniversaries when they come and go. Well, I know we've gone a little bit over, but thank you so much. I'm happy to sign books. There's the memoir outside. There's poetry books in here. And thank you so much for coming. Had surgery and mm. we just we returned and the prognosis is good. So I was sort of staggered thinking oh, of that as you were reading it. Pretty inspiring stuff. Thank you so much. Thank and you very so much. much for coming. I'm Laura. Can I just make that to Laura? Sure. I like the bracelet. How are you doing? My uh, 16 year old daughter put this together. So. Yeah, um, I actually found my way to you. Um, I don't exactly remember how, but um, um, finding out probably just through Amazon or some web search, I discovered the, a, a book that you wrote about um, journal writing for teenagers. Yes. Um, and it, I. It was said to be a print, um, but you can so buy I, a really I said, cheap copy on Amazon. Yeah, so I, my, I have a 16 year old daughter and um, bought it for her. I'm not sure she. Yeah, I wish it was still in print, writing with it, but. Then, then I uh, Googled you and your website, and uh, I have, right now I have um, brother and sister-in-law um, are married to each other, but um, both have um, been diagnosed with uh, brain tumors within a year apart. Um, um, yeah, uh, so... The kind of thing you want to share. Yeah. 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 It's just Gen yeah. genetically unrelated. Yeah. People yeah. in the same household. Yeah. 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 But it, your expression yeah. through writing is yeah. Thank you so much, Lauren. Really good to meet you. Right? Yeah. First year is back there. Take yeah. The, yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm just gathering. I'm not sure. can't do everything. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of what we find more and more as we go forward. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have. Uh, I have. 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 I have.